to be together today. Ooh, little feedback. Do I need to come back or go forward? I'm good. Okay. Um, so, in light of the new CDC recommendations for outside gatherings, you can take your masks off. Ain't that grand? Now, <laughs> we are suggesting, uh, for the sake of those who may not be vaccinated, that when we sing, uh, maybe we could put them back on, um, just so we need we can be careful and sensitive to uh, those who might not be vaccinated or kids that are not eligible to be vaccinated. So um, obviously, if you would feel more comfortable, please wear your mask. Uh, please, please, but. Uh, if you if you would like to take your mask off, especially while you're sitting, you know, I think we're okay. All right, uh, there will be this week a poll going out over the email uh, that will ask questions like, "Are you fully vaccinated?" and "Would you be interested in attending a shortened indoor worship?" at St. Peter's. Another question, would you be interested in attending a shortened uh, inside service at St. Peter's? We really need to know your feelings. In order to make good decisions, we need to know. Now, I sent out another poll at the beginning of the COVID business, and out of all of the people in the parish, I got 11 responses. <laughs> If I get 11 this time, there is no way to know what we should do next. Please, please respond. Also, uh, you, you'll have a link. Click the link in your email. Click the link, go there, do the, do the uh, survey. Also, if there are two people in your household, do the survey, both of you do the survey. Not just one per household. Everybody needs to do it. And we, so, okay, did I say enough? Really, I need you, I need you to do it. And it will, it will help the council to make the decisions we need to make. So I look forward to hearing all of your responses. All right, uh, next thing. We have confirmation today at one o'clock here outside. Uh, Monday, tomorrow, we have coffee and conversation. And then I will be heading uh, on vacation for a week.
Rise if you desire and you are able for the brief order for confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance, and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit, and we fear a difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us. So that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus. Through whom we have obtained grace upon grace, our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us join in singing our gathering hymn, Now the Green Blade Rises. Oh, it is the peace 
let us pray. O oh God, you give us your Son as the vine, apart from whom we cannot live. Nourish our life in his resurrection, that we may bear the fruit of love and know the fullness of your joy. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. First reading comes from the book of Acts, chapter 8. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home, seated in his chariot. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb, silent before its shearer, so does he not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, About whom, may I ask, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Please read our psalm responsibly as found in your bulletins. Psalm 22. From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the sight of those who fear the Lord. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Let those who seek the Lord give praise. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of nations shall bow before God. For dominion belongs to the Lord, who rules over the nations. Indeed, all who sleep in the earth shall bow down in worship. All who go down to the dust, though they be dead, shall kneel before the Lord. Their descendants shall serve the Lord, whom they shall proclaim to generations to come. They shall proclaim God's deliverance to a people yet unborn. Saying to them, the Lord has acted. Our second reading comes from the first book of John, chapter 4. <coughs> Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. 
Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he is in us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God and they abide in God. So we have known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers and sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. John, the 15th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. We will join in our response to the Gospel, which is actually a different response than our Gospel acclamation.
pray with me a prayer that we've already prayed in song. Lord, let my heart be good soil, open to the seed of your word. In our hearts, let love grow, let peace be understood. When our hearts are hard, break them open. When our hearts are cold, warm them. When we are lost, lead us. Amen. Grace to you and peace from the God in whom we live and move and have our very being. In our gospel text for today, we hear Jesus comparing himself to a vine and God to a farmer. And then he says that we are like the branches on that vine. Jesus says that God, the farmer, prunes the vine so that the vine will bear more and more fruit. Have you ever walked through a vineyard? Have you seen how the vines are pruned and shaped and carefully tended? The farmer doesn't just let the vines grow all over the place, growing crazy in this direction or that direction. The farmer prunes and guides and shapes the vines so that they will bear fruit abundantly. I was at Guy and Betty Weenies a couple of weeks ago. Betty was helping Liz with a project for school and I walked out into the garden where Guy was hanging out in the garden. And in this garden, Betty grows raspberries. And Guy has constructed a raised bed that has wires strung under tension to which the raspberries and other things can be tied to in order to keep them from growing all crazy over the rest of the garden. Now, although I'm certainly no expert, I think grapes are grown in a similar way. And Jesus uses this metaphor about the vine to teach us to stay close to him, abide in him so that we can bear much fruit. Now, if we take the metaphor, metaphor too far, we might be tempted to imagine God restraining us, cutting us back, holding us in bondage, attached to a trellis or a guide wire that will help to hold us in place. We do need to stay close to Jesus. We do well when we cling to the divine so that we can remain in God. But we are not restrained. In fact, what we find in the early church after Pentecost is that the Holy Spirit is pushing and shoving the church beyond its comfortable place behind the locked door. At Pentecost, the Spirit comes in with a rush of a violent wind and blows the apostles right out the door. See, both things can be true. Both things can happen at the same time. God can draw us close and God can shove us out the door and out of our comfortable seats at the same time. The Holy Spirit pushes and pulls us. The Holy Spirit shoves us beyond borders and through thresholds through which we might otherwise be too afraid to cross. Our text from Acts shows us one such border crossing. The whole book of Acts shows us one border crossing after another. The church is far from restraint. The Holy Spirit is pushing and shoving the church in new directions in every chapter. Now, depending on the story, or maybe depending on our perspective, don't you love it? <laughs> 
depending on our perspective, we can see the focus shifting from one point of view to another. What I mean is that sometimes the focus is on the Holy Spirit. Sometimes the focus is on the people who are inside of the church, the followers of Jesus who are now apostles. But sometimes what we see brought into focus is the point of view of those who are on the outside of the church looking in. We can look at most of the stories from all three perspectives if we try hard enough. In the text of the Ethiopian eunuch that we have read today for our first lesson, we can absolutely do that. So in the book of Acts, we see the struggle of the early church. Here's what's happening. The spirit is pushing the church, pushing, pulling, shoving the church to cross all kinds of boundaries. And in many ways, the church resists the Holy Spirit. And we cannot criticize. We see the church of the 21st century and certainly the 20th century, when we look back, still doing this in our time. 50 years ago, the Lutheran church struggled through the question of whether or not women could be pastors. The Holy Spirit was pulling in one direction and many people, frankly, were resisting that pulling. The Holy Spirit won that one for which I am very thankful. But many churches today are still resisting that direction of the Spirit. In 2009, the ELCA struggled again with a very similar boundary crossing. Can a person that identifies as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or queer be a pastor? That's the question. We decided that yes, the Holy Spirit is shoving us to be a more inclusive church and to welcome fully into the life of the church people who are LGBT or Q. Not just welcome them to sit in the pews, but welcome to fully engage in the life of the church. Bring your children to baptism, serve on council, and consider is the Holy Spirit calling you to be a pastor? And if indeed she is, then by all means, seek ordination. And congregations now have the opportunity to call a pastor who identifies as LGBT or gay. We in the ELCA are not alone in this process. Some churches have moved through this same path that we did, and some have chosen a different path. The struggle is real. In the book of Acts, we see the struggle. Should we welcome into the church people who are not Jewish and have no desire to be Jewish, but do want to be Christian? That was the question that they were struggling with. The covenant of Abraham states that people of God, the people who have God, of God who are male, should be circumcised. Do male Christians need to be circumcised? Can someone who is not circumcised be welcomed into the church? That was the question in the book of Acts. Can a person who is a foreigner be welcomed into the church? That was a question. Parts of the scripture say no. But the Holy Spirit is pushing and shoving and we don't know what to do, the church says. There's conflict. Not just between people, but even within people. Peter doesn't know which way to go. His internal conflict is real and it's very visible. He knows what the scriptures say, but he has seen Gentiles receive the Holy Spirit. He has seen them speak in tongues even, and he says to himself and to his colleagues, who am I to say no when God has already said yes? Do we really need to vote on this when God has already declared it to be? Sometimes the Holy Spirit pushes and shoves us into really uncomfortable positions. 
In today's text from Acts, we meet a eunuch from Ethiopia. Ethiopia is a far off place, foreign for sure. And a eunuch? A eunuch has missing parts by surgery or by accident or by nature. If you want to see what Jesus has to say about this, go to Matthew 19, 12. Write that down. A eunuch has had parts cut off. Or they are born without parts that make it impossible to reproduce. A eunuch cannot sire children. In some royal households around the world, males were castrated prior to puberty in order to make them eunuchs so that they could serve the queen without threat of sexual misconduct. This was possibly the situation of the person in our story today because we know that they served the Kandake, queen of the Ethiopians. The eunuch had been to Jerusalem to worship. But here's the thing. Deuteronomy 23.1 clearly states that the eunuch shall not be permitted in the assembly of the people of God. The Bible says that. And yet, he had been to Jerusalem to worship. Was he welcome? Did he wonder, will I be welcome? Will I need to stand outside and look through a window? Will I need to stay out in the courtyard? Deuteronomy said to the eunuch, you are not welcome. But Philip, interpreting the scriptures, said to him something else. The eunuch was in his chariot reading the Isaiah scroll and the Holy Spirit told Philip to go and talk to him, and so he did. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked him. How can I, unless someone guides me, said the Ethiopian. And so Philip got into the chariot with him, and they talked about the scriptures. Philip told him about Jesus who had been cut off. Jesus who had been humiliated. Jesus who came to show us God's love for all people. And when they came upon some water, the eunuch asked Philip, what is to prevent me from being baptized? Am I welcome? Am I welcome to be a part of the people of God who follow Jesus? I wonder if there was internal conflict between Philip's head and his heart. The council had not yet voted to welcome in the eunuchs. But the Holy Spirit had sent him to minister to this person. Who was he to say no when God had already said yes? Philip had to be thinking, I am pretty sure this is going to make a lot of people mad. But... Who am I to get in the way of the work of the Holy Spirit? And so he baptized the eunuch in the water that was there. And then Philip returned to his work, proclaiming the good news. And the eunuch returned to Ethiopia. And we don't know how things went for him from that point forward, but the church in Ethiopia is still going really strong today. Do you think maybe he went from asking, am I welcome, to proclaiming the good news in Africa? I like to think so. If he did, it was because Philip refused to get in the way of the Holy Spirit when it pushed him beyond the comfortable boundaries of the church. I wonder what boundaries the Holy Spirit will push and shove us through, don't you? One of my favorite preachers of all time was Fred Craddock. Dr. Craddock 
told a story that resonates really strongly. He tells a story about the church that he served while he was still in seminary. It was a beautiful white church. And the churchyard was well kept and the building was well maintained. The church was in Tennessee. During his tenure there, the community exploded with laborers brought in to work at the newly developed nuclear project. They lived all around in tents and in trailers. They were kind of a scruffy looking bunch. And as an enthusiastic young pastor, he had wanted to do some evangelism and invite the workers to the church. But there was a problem. The church didn't want them at all. After services one Sunday, he called a meeting of the church's leadership and he presented his plans. Oh, I don't know. I don't think they'd fit in here one church member said. They're just here temporarily. They're just construction people. They'll be leaving us pretty soon. And the young preacher countered with another plea to his church. Surely they need to hear the gospel while they're here. But he ran out of time before convincing them. And so it was decided that they would take a vote on the next Sunday. One week later, at the outset of the meeting, one church member said, I move that in order for uh, someone to be a member of this church, you must own property in the county. And it was quickly seconded and passed. End of story. Years later, that same pastor, by that time a nationally renowned preacher, returned to the area with his wife, Nettie. And he wanted to show her that little church that he had served all those years ago. The countryside had changed over the years along with the road, but eventually Dr. Craddock eventually found his way to that little white building and stopped the car. And you know what? That parking lot was full. It was full of cars and pickup trucks and motorcycles. And the church now sported a sign that read, barbecue, all you can eat. <laughs> and he said, well, we might as well go in for lunch. And they saw the old pews lining the wall and the old pump organ pushed into a corner. Those pews were full with people waiting to be seated at the aluminum leg tables that were covered with plastic tablecloths, which were filled with people filling themselves on pork and chicken. The church was filled with all sorts of people, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia. And Dr. Craddock leaned over to his wife and whispered, it's a good thing this isn't still a church, otherwise these people would not be welcome here. The Ethiopian was in that chariot, flipping through the Bible, looking, through, looking, looking for himself. Am I welcome? Am I welcome to be a part of this? Am I welcome here? And Philip thought, who am I to say no? When God has already said yes. Spirit is at work. Who are we to say no when God says yes? Let's sing our hymn of the day.
Let us together confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Alive in the risen Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, we bring our prayers before God who promises to hear us and answer in steadfast love. God of all fruitfulness, you abide in your church, and your church abides in you. Cleanse us by your word, and give yourself to the whole church on earth so that it bears fruit and witnesses to your love. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You have created the heavens and the earth. As we wonder at the beauty of creation, May we seek vital connections among all that depends on the earth for life. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You rule the nations with justice and love. Give the leaders of the earth assurance of your abiding presence, so that they lead not by fear, but with love for those that they are called to serve. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You have loved us so that we can love others. We pray for all in need of your love, those who are poor, lowly, outcast, weak, or fearful. Provide for the needs of all, especially those that we lift to you now in our hearts or with our voices. Hear us, O oh God. You gather us with all the saints by the power of your spirit, especially with Athanasius, Bishop of Alexandria, and those that we name before you. With them, may our hearts live forever in your keeping. Hear us, O oh God. In the hope of new life in Christ, we raise our prayers to you, trusting in your never-ending goodness and mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Please share the peace of Christ with one another with waves, peace signs, comments, and share the peace of Christ throughout the week as well in all that you say and do as you come upon across uh, people in your day-to-day -day life. Let's continue with our offering. Remember, uh, you can place your offering here in the basket. You can send it in. You can uh, support your church in numerous ways. Um, but also remember to support uh, the work of the church all over the world uh, through organizations that are caring for those who struggle. Let us join in our offertory response.
Let us pray. God of love, you call us beloved children and welcome us to your table. Receive our lives and the gifts we offer. Abide with us and send us in service to a suffering world. For the sake of your beloved child, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Easter people, lift up your hearts. People of Easter's joy, give thanks to the one who raises us to new life. We sing our to the God of everlasting love. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ the true Paschal Lamb who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures and with angels, archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. from age to age. Praise to you for creating the heavens and the earth. Praise to you for saving the earth from the waters of the flood. Praise to you for bringing the Israelites safely through the seas. Praise to you for leading your people through the wilderness to the land of milk and honey. Praise to you for the words and deeds of Jesus, your anointed one. Praise to you for the death and resurrection of Christ. Praise to you for your spirit poured out on all nations. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to, all to drink, saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. With this bread and cup, we remember our Lord's Passover from death to life as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. Christ, Christ is, is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will come, come again. again. God of resurrection and new life, pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and wine. Bless this feast. Grace our table with your presence. Come, Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Reveal yourself to us in the breaking of the bread. Raise us up as the body of Christ for the world. Breathe new life into us. Send us forth burning with justice and peace and love. Come, Holy Spirit. With your holy ones of all time and places, with the, with the earth and all its creatures, with sun and moon and stars, we praise you, O blessed and holy Trinity now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The risen Christ invites us to the table. Come, eat, and be satisfied. Jesus, I'm 
is prepared. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Wellspring of joy, through this meal you have put gladness in our hearts. Satisfy the hunger still around us and send us as joyful witnesses that your love may bring joy to the hearts of all people. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now, may our glorious God grant you a spirit of wisdom to know and to love the risen Lord Jesus, <clears throat> the God of life, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Let us join in our sending him on our way rejoicing. <gasps>
go in peace. Share the good news. Alleluia.